Hi everybody and welcome to our academic open house here at the Geneva Graduate Institute. This is the first event of this kind that we're doing and we're very excited to have our uh, department heads for our disciplinary <laughs> programs here with us today to answer your questions and also some students that you can see behind us um, who will also be available to share their experiences. We have collected your questions in advance on the uh, event board. Thank you so much for sending those in. We may not have time to get to all of them, but there will be a live chat along with this video where you can ask questions. And uh, you can also find all the information about our programs in the links that will be posted in the comments right underneath the, uh, the video. So you can click on that. Um, we had a very last minute um, it's something that came up for our interdisciplinary master program and so they unfortunately cannot join us for this live event. However, we will get round to answering all of the questions that you posted about the interdisciplinary program. There will be a separate way for us to do that that we will announce very shortly on the event page on our website as well. And if you're interested in the interdisciplinary program, please stay with us because as you know, our interdisciplinary program is very much enriched and nourished by our disciplinary programs and you will hear a lot about those today. So that will be very valuable information for you as well in terms of preparing your application and thinking about doing this program with us. The first department head uh, to present the programs is here with me today, um, Professor Yussi Hanimaki. And we also have one of our PhD students in the history department, Paul, who is uh, going to be joining us. So for a few minutes, uh, Yussi, can you um, tell us a little bit about the curricula in the master and the PhD program in history? Yes, yeah, sure. So um, we are obviously a unique department in, in all kinds of ways. Our motto is understand, uh, understand the present, prepare the future. And where we get there, how we get there is basically looking at history and how it connects with many of the global challenges that, that, we, that the world faces today. Um, what that means is that we, we look at a number of those issues that we all are following today uh, on the news, such as uh, war and peace. If you think about Russia and Ukraine, we, we have, um, we have uh, courses on, on these issues that is part of our central, central part of our curriculum is to investigate the causes of, of conflict. And, and how conflicts uh, change our lives um, all, around the, all around the world. We look at environmental issues, which obviously is one of those big existential concerns of, of today. We look at all of these issues, migration, refugees, uh, global health, of course, has been very much a, a significant issue in all of our lives over the past, past few years because of, uh, of the COVID pandemic. So we offer courses on these uh, topics that are of contemporary concern. We look at them in a historical perspective because our belief is that if you really want to understand the present, how we got here, uh, the only way really we can do that is going back into the past and see what, as Mark Twain puts it, rhymes <laughs> with the past, what is unique and what is, what, is, uh, what is something that actually is not that new, but something that we can perhaps find a pattern in the past that can then help us this is what we wish to depart, impart to our students, help us prepare the future, which is, of course, why anybody would study um, at the Institute overall, is because you're preparing your futures, and your futures is part of a, a global community. So what we want to do is, through our curriculum, um, to impart some lessons of the past or understanding of the past, to make you think historically, in a, in a sense, about the present, and help you then think about possible ways of preparing a better future, which is, of course, what we all, all want. Um, so we have lots of different courses, obviously. We don't cover everything. We are not a traditional history department in that sense. But, but some of the issues that, that we're quite strong on is the history of racism, uh, which, of course, is something we hear about every day. Um, I mentioned the environment. So this is another issue, global health, um, um, gender rights. These are issues. And then we have the sort of what you might classify as somewhat more traditional issues about global governance, international governance, conflict and conflict resolution. So, so we have a wide curriculum. It doesn't cover everything. It doesn't go back to the Middle Ages. Normally we look at the long 20th century in our courses uh, as the focus. Uh, but it is something that is always also future-oriented, um, although 
the emphasis always is on understanding the past uh, and the present in a way of, of looking at at how to how we go to the next uh, next few decades. So, so that's it. It's Geneva is a wonderful place to do this for for a simple reason. This is where a lot of these issues have been debated, discussed, agreed or not agreed upon in so-called international Geneva. We are at the heart of international Geneva. We are ourselves very international, both in terms of our uh, our, our uh, staff, faculty, as well as the student body that we have. So it's it's a it's an interesting environment where you can sort of think about think outside the box in a sense, be challenged to, to get away from your comfort zone perhaps, um, think about something that is not, that goes against conventional wisdom uh, in some way. So that is an, another point that we like to do. We have the MA and the PhD programs that are somewhat different obviously in their, in their focus, uh, with the MA being mostly taught courses uh, over two years with a thesis at the end and then the PhD is a few courses in the beginning, but mostly focusing on a specific research project. So maybe that is a sort of rough idea um, of, of where we are. That's a great idea. Thank you so much. Um, one question that I was going to ask, but you kind of covered it already, um, was how does the program bridge the two areas of international history on one hand and politics on the other? I think we have kind of um, covered that a little bit, but Paul, I would be curious to know in your PhD program, how that has actually been reflected. And maybe you can uh, mention quickly what you're doing your PhD on. Yes, we, with pleasure. Um, I think we, the, the professor came to the conclusion, and of course history is political, and, and politics has also a long history. So for, for historically, the, the, the program was called uh, only history, and then changed to history and politics. So the, the two are really intertwined. Um, my research focuses more on history of science, or history of ethology. So I think it really speaks to the freedom we have when it mm, came to choosing our, our, our topic. So it's not you, even if you are more interested, like, as I said, history of science and not solely politics, you are really, really free to, to choose. We have a professor also um, more interested and invested in the history, intellectual history, uh, philosophy, also thematic history, as you mentioned, racism, but also history of violence, as well as uh, regional expertise, so more uh, traditional. And yeah, I think my, my research um, focusing on the history of ethology and somehow in animal behavior speaks to really the, the freedom we have when it came to, to choosing a topic. Yeah, fascinating. So we've, we've been able to even weave in animal behavior into our very much social sciences uh, graduate institute here, which is uh, really exciting. Maybe one last question um, for either of you, really. But um, you see, maybe um, typically, where do historians find work after they finish? So historians uh, find work. It depends, of course, a little bit. If you do a PhD like, like Paul is doing, then Normally, the, the primary choice for most of our PhD students is to find an academic position at, uh, at the university level, if uh, ideally. And so that for the PhD students, that is, uh, that's what often happens. Uh, we have several former PhD students teaching at places like St. Andrews in, in Scotland, at Boston University in the United States, at, uh, at Leiden University in the Netherlands. Uh, a few other universities in Switzerland itself and, and so forth. So we've been able to place a lot of our, our PhD, recent PhDs in particular in the last 10 years to very good programs. So that's for the PhD. For the MAs, um, it's a much more varied story. And I, I think what, uh, what probably are the, the couple of the more um, prominent tracks in, in this is one is diplomacy. Unquestionably, diplomacy broadly understood as sort of either working for some of the Geneva-based international organizations often, um, and a lot of some of our students intern during their program at, with, with one of these, and that then gives them a boost in going into, uh, into the, uh, the, their careers. Um, perhaps international non-governmental organizations. Um, we have uh, just next door, we, there's the Democratic Control of the Armed Forces, mm -hmm. where one of our former students heads the Sub-Saharan program, uh, for example. So that's another track. But beyond that, um, journalism is, mm -hmm. is, an, is an interesting option for a lot of our, our students. And because we, we've put an emphasis on writing skills, on performance in terms of oral performance and so forth, it is often an attractive and they're well-trained 
to especially manage to sort of intern or have to get some experience, real life experience during their studies, um, that can offer another uh, very fruitful career. Ma some of our master's students also go as Paul has to continue on, you know, because they love us, love us so much and, <laughs> and they want to continue studying their specific interests, so they continue from the master's directly sometimes to the mm -hmm. PhD mm -hmm. program. Thank you. Paul, anything else yeah. to add? Maybe I can just uh, mention the one of the particularities of the of the master of the the program in general is the is the ratio one to one almost between right. professor and student. So we are really a small department, and you can really build a, a research relationship with your supervisor, uh, well, whether it's a, a PhD supervisor or master supervisor. You you really get to know the professor and his or her research. And I think it's really a, yeah a really engaging way of of working in a really small uh, small department. Thank you so much for covering the International History and Politics Department for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will invite our next speakers. Um, so we will have Professor Andrew Clapham from the International Law Department and Professor Cedric Till from the Economics Department. will join us next. Hello, gentlemen. Who would like to start? Okay, so Professor Andrew Clapham from the International Law Department. Hi, Andrew. Hi. And uh, tell us a little about the programs in international law. Thank you. Well, there are the two programs uh, that you know about, the two-year Masters in International Law and the four-year PhD in International Law. And then we actually have five other programs, which I won't detail, but very briefly, there's an LLM, um, which is for professionalizing people who want to practice as a lawyer, and that is done under executive education. And then there are three degrees with the University of Geneva. So you get a joint degree from the Graduate Institute and the University of Geneva. One is in human rights and humanitarian law. One is in international dispute settlement, and a third in transitional justice. And lastly, because I'll be in trouble if I leave them out, there is an LLM with Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., where you spend half your time here and half your time there, and that's in global health law, and that's new. What else would you like to know? <laughs> um, we obviously have a great connection to international Geneva. We have legal advisors from the World Health Organization, the World Intellectual Property um, Organization, many people working closely with the Human Rights Council or the World Trade Organization. And all of the professors, I would say, are committed to dealing with both international law in theory and international law in practice. So the idea is that students have one, an outsider perspective on what is going on, but also the benefit of being here with practitioners who can give them a bit of an inside sense of what happens in international law. Maybe lastly, we offer law clinics um, in various topics, law of the sea and trade, and then moot courts, which deal with international law, well, trade organization law, et il y a bien sûr le concours Rousseau qui est en français. Okay, wonderful, thank you. One question that comes up a lot in, um, in our interactions with prospects is the decision whether to go for the LLM, which is a one-year program in international law, or the two-year Master of Arts in International Law? How would somebody go about making that decision? That's a great question, and indeed, uh, we have a lot of people asking about this. So essentially, the LLM is really for people who have already got a Master's and are looking for what we call professionalization. So they might want to go on and work in a law firm or at the United Nations or in think tank, but it's less academic than the two-year master's, which really is a way of preparing people for a PhD or a research career. Right. So one is more practice-orientated practice and the other is more academic. And obviously one is one year and one is two. Okay, thank you. Um, so on the same topic of uh, you know, choosing our particular program, and this is a question I would like to put to our students. If, uh, I think we have a couple of students from, from the program here. Why would... Um, somebody choose to come and study international law um, with us rather than at another, at another university. I don't know if anybody in the back would like to address that. Go ahead. I'd love to. Maybe give us your, your name and, uh, yeah. Um, I'm Eduardo. I'm currently in the second year of the International Law Masters. Um, and basically, especially if we consider continental Europe and also including the UK, we have like many professors in different areas of specialization and very much likely one is bound to find a professor that is very good in that 
field. And not only that, particularly for myself, one of my greatest interests in coming here was to know general international law and its branches to some extent so as to understand it more holistically. So it's not like, even though it's in Geneva with WTO and human rights organizations, it's not very uh, only focused on those areas, but one gets a sense of many other areas and branches and uh, activities involving international law. And as I said, and I'd like to uh, make that clear, uh, we have excellent professors in um, practically all branches of international law, really. Uh, and this ratio of stars professors that we have here, usually other high-level universities in continental Europe, they would have two, three, four. And here, like, basically, uh, all of them are in this tier. Thank you so much. Um, Anna, do you have any, anything to add? Uh, one aspect to being Geneva here at the Institute is also to be very much connected with uh, International Geneva. So I think also the master's program offers already sort of the, the connection to the professional environment. Um, there are also possibilities to have internships around here. So I think Gen just the having also the location of Geneva is a, a good starting point for any academic or professional career and also provides the opportunity to know which path one wants to go. Okay, thank you. And Andrew, you, this is something that you, you touched upon as well uh, before. So maybe just uh, one last question for you. Um, and, you know, Andrew, you've, you've been with the Institute for uh, over 20 years, so you've probably seen how this has evolved over time. Um, to what extent does our curriculum address human rights issues, gender justice, gender equality, and those kinds of things? Have you seen um, a development recently, or how has that evolved in, in our programs over time? Oh no, it's definitely evolved. I mean, the focus now on gender questions, race questions, sexual orientation questions 20 years ago was minimal, um, till I arrived. Uh, <laughs> and I would say it's a much more modern and contemporary uh, syllabus now. There is an emphasis as, that's been stressed on general international law. We have the International Law Commission here. Most of the international lawyers coming through would at some stage get very interested in much broader issues, but anybody who wanted to specialize in any aspect of human rights or humanitarian law um, would find somebody, as has been suggested, who would be fairly specialized in it. I mean, maybe just to explain this point about the concentration of international lawyers at the Institute, normally in a law faculty in any university in the world, you might have one or two people who teach international law at the professorial level. And here we have over 12, and it would probably be the highest concentration of international law professors in the world. I mean, just imagine, all grouped here. Wow. So you could travel to Berlin or Paris or London or Oxford or Harvard or wherever, and you wouldn't find as many international lawyers in one place, all making international law together. Wonderful. On that inspiration, thank you so much, Andrew. And we're going to change gears and uh, talk a little bit about our programs in international economics and development economics with the head of the program, Professor Cedric Till, who is with us today. So, Cedric, tell us a little bit in general about the programs in economics. Well, thank you for the opportunity. So, if I were to give two keywords for economics training, it would be policy orientation on one hand and rigorous toolkit on the other hand. So, why is that? What we do here in training economics is not, I would say, economics for its own sake, but it's economics with a policy purpose. Right. And that's really something that you'll see throughout our curriculum. Um, and to, to do that, we cover many topics. Our core field would be international trade, international macroeconomics, and development economics. Uh, in fact, we have two PhDs in the department, one in international economics, one in development economics. Um, and this area shouldn't be thought as like silos. Far from it. There's actually a lot of movement in between. Uh, there's a lot of um, transversal themes. So now we're having more and more going into environment economics, uh, including on the finance side. We're actually just starting a master in sustainable finance. 
Um, there's also an uh, issue of uh, history, economic history. We have professors that are joined with the uh, history and industrial politics department. So you get this really uh, this cross-sectional view. And at the institute more generally, you can, and in fact you have to, take classes in other departments. So this is really a place that gives you a broad package. Now the second part is the, the technical rigor. Okay. Uh, to make a difference to, when you go to policy institution and to really contribute, you have to be equipped. There is a, a clear demand on that, and we do equip you. But again, this is not just doing technical aspect for their own sake. It's, again, with a purpose. So you are equipped when you have to do statistical analysis. When you go, like many of our development colleagues do, do field surveys uh, and build the data that you will use out of that. So this are really the core area. Um, the policy emphasis, let me add to that, the faculty here is very well connected with the policy. Many of, world, of us actually work in policy places. I myself worked in the Central Bank for nine years before coming here. Uh, and for those who are not in policy anymore, well, we remain active by being advisors to various uh, bodies. We have also very strong connections with places like the WTO, just mm -hmm. next door. Uh, with various central bank, with the BIS. Uh, we have a fairly big alumni group in multilateral institutions such as the World Bank or the IMF. So if what you want to do is come and work in economic policy, we are the place to train you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for emphasizing the um, transdisciplinary approach, which I think is, is really general to the entire institute and to everything that, that we do here. So that's very clear. In, in those programs as well. Um, a lot of questions that I receive from prospective students um, ask about the distinction between economics and finance. So um, students will ask, well, you know, I have a background in, in finance. Is that going to be okay for me to, to come to this program? So can you, is there a distinction? How do we make it? And, and how does that play in terms of people's preparation? for the program. Okay, so we are not, we would say, a finance oriented right. school. So if you want to be you know, a banker or an asset manager, we're probably not the right. But if you want to work in a policy institution and understand well the functioning of financial markets, that is something we do provide. So we do definitely have a whole side of uh, finance and financial economics more broadly, but really as informing broader macroeconomic policy. You know, since many years, you cannot do uh, general economic policy without thinking of what happens in financial market. We have a very big financial globalization, maybe too big. That's actually a question on one with many colleagues have worked. So we do equip you with understanding this, but again, that fits as a tool uh, to understand the policy design, not uh, as a way to, to train people into being asset managers or similar tasks. That's clear. Thank you so much. Um, another question that comes up all the time and I think is very important is, um, and I would like to uh, ask any students that we have in the audience from the economics department as well, is the, the balance between um, the policy side and the quantitative. So how much time do students actually spend working on statistical analysis, on econometrics, and working with numbers as opposed to working with policy? I don't know if we have any uh, economic students. So yes. I guess my answer will be a bit different from master students as I'm in PhD. My name is Antoine. I'm in PhD in international economics. Um, so it's true, as, as uh, Professor Till was mentioning, we uh, spend a lot of time using statistical tool, obviously, but in order to get policy relevant research questions, we, we also spend a lot of time about reading about international news, like to generate some research ideas at the same time. So I would say there is a balance uh, between the two. Um, and that is actually needed in order to, to, uh, to get to the research idea that we want to work and that we find relevant. But then maybe, I don't know, in terms of masters in economics, probably also different. Hello, my name is Sarah, and I'm a master's student in international economics. So regarding the balance between statistics and policy orientation, I would say that we do have rigorous courses when it comes to quant heavy things. So we do courses like we do the math, math boots camp, which is very useful in doing the coursework that you would have to do over the two years. And we do two courses in econometrics. We do have, however, have a lot of other electives or other disciplinary courses you can take that encourage you to look into what is going on in the, in the field right now, what new research is coming up with regards to policy. And I feel like that provides a balance. However, I would say that you, 
as a student, we need to actually go out of your comfort zone to look through these things and actually seek out what the impulses of these papers are. If not, you would lose out on that aspect of the master's program. Thank you. Um, so just the last, uh, on the same topic, um, to reassure or to help some of our uh, applicants that are working on their applications right now, um, how much preparation do people need to have in quantitative skills before they begin the program? So I would say you need courses uh, at <clears throat> an advanced undergraduate level in statistics uh, and math. Uh, but as was just said, you know, uh, before you come and start the master, for the three weeks prior, we have the so-called math bootcamp. Right. Uh, the, it's not as scary as the name uh, <laughs> tends to suggest, but that's uh, a, a course where we equip you with the tools that you will need to go through the program. And throughout the classes, uh, you have the class, of course, with a professor, but you also have uh, interaction with the teaching assistants uh, that also go through the technical aspects. Uh, so you are, you are not left on your own. In fact, and here I um, um, really come back and second what was said before. Uh, this is really a place where you have a very nice student to faculty ratio. Mm -hmm. We don't have massive auditorium where you feel you lost on your own. You can have really interaction with the faculty, go and ask your question, come to the uh, office hours and get really uh, personalized feedback. Okay, thank you so much. I think that will be very helpful to our applicants in the uh, programs in international economics. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you very much, Cedric. So for the last round of our interviews today, I would like to invite uh, the head of our anthropology and sociology program, Professor Aditya Bharadwaj, and the head of our program in international relations and political science, Professor Anna Leander. Hi, thank you so much for joining me today. Who would like to start? Happy to. Okay, thank you, Anna. Okay, so, um, Again, in general, what can you tell us about the program in international relations and political science? That is an excellent program, of course. Uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and except for that, uh, so the, the core aims of our program is really to uh, provide uh, our students with a very thorough understanding of international relations and uh, politics and with an opportunity to specialize. So basically the study program is uh, organized around uh, very heavy core courses that I think are also very interesting and exciting, where we cover both different kinds of approaches to politics and international relations, and the issues involved practice, both theoretical and practical, uh, and then uh, electives, uh, and we really encourage our students to make the most of the uh, institute and the very exciting environment that's here. Because in fact, many, many of the things that people work on in other departments, we've just heard uh, economics and law, but it would be true of uh, anthropology and sociology, uh, could easily fit uh, within uh, an international relations and political science specialization. So we really encourage students to draw benefit from that and to develop uh, the kinds of interests that they have uh, at a very high level. So a combination of a very strong footprint from the department uh, with the approaches and methodologies that are core to us uh, and then an encouragement to take them further. Um, and to make this possible, so th it's a postgraduate program that we have, and so it's a, actually a, at a high level. Uh, we start the year with an introductory course where we basically help people to develop a common language for handling uh, this very complicated process, actually, uh, of uh, managing talking across. Um, so the core aims that we have uh, with the program uh, is really to provide students with an ability that's unusually broad for our field to speak across different ways of working with international relations and politics and so uh, become, let's say, multilingual or able uh, to work in different contexts and at the same time give them the opportunity to specialize uh, on something that they see important. And so the faculty we have reflects that. We have a very um, pluralistic faculty with people that have very different backgrounds and research interests and it's actually very exciting uh, and of course often very complicated uh, to to work in this but really mainly you I think it's a very useful way because that of course is what happens to most people in real life you know you have to work 
uh, across uh, this kind of uh, diversity. Uh, and um, I think we see it. We have a very active student body that's very uh, engaged in institutional mm -hmm. politics and also in the politics of the department and that we're very proud of. Thank you so much for that general overview. And again, we can see the uh, multi and transdisciplinary um, approach that is so uh, important to us at the Institute. So if we do a slightly deeper dive into the program, um, the program has uh, both disciplines in its title, as some of our other programs do too. So international relations, is that the same thing as political science? Um, how does the program bridge those two uh, disciplines or th those two approaches within the curriculum? Uh, so, uh, of course, th the, the connection between politics and international relations is uh, a very uh, contested one, let's put it like that. Uh, and one of the aims of our program is really to help people think about what that relationship is or how it should be understood. So uh, it's actually, there's not a simple answer to that question, except we, it's precisely the aim. Uh, so if politics, uh, one of the very conventional definitions of politics is the authoritative distribution of values, uh, one of the very... Uh, or conventional definitions of international relations is that it's uh, politics under conditions of anarchy. Of course, both are extremely contested and both can be related to the field. International relations was established against people who thought that uh, the international functioned as the national. Uh, that's the origins of the discipline. So against the lawyers who thought that mm -hmm. uh, we could uh, rule uh, with law that was state-based at the international level, which we can't because there's no state. So all of these discussions, and of course, Today, this is we have a, we've just heard the biggest concentration of international lawyers here. There's a huge body of international law. There's a lot of politics that's transnational. So uh, we actually open up these issues uh, and help people uh, uh, think about them and think about how that relationship actually operates. I Thank hope you. that makes sense. It does, and it's interesting. Thank you very much for for clarifying that. Um, and so if we um, step outside of the program a little bit. Um, one question that comes up a lot is, um, how do people make a choice between this program, the disciplinary program in international relations political science, or the international affairs and development program that we have? The uh, interdisciplinary programs, of course, uh, leaves, you, like the, leaves you with um, uh, an openness uh, and actually the possibility to develop what you talked about before as uh, transdisciplinarity, so working across different disciplines. We really uh, have the intention with the core footprint to give people a strong anchoring in a very specific uh, field that comes with uh, not only specific forms of knowledge that we can then integrate and work across the other disciplines with, but it's the disciplinary knowledge that primes in the disciplinary program uh, for logical mm -hmm. reasons. Uh, it also comes in with institutions. So if we think about how the professional world is organized uh, for researchers, uh, their academic conferences, they're very often organized um, in disciplinary fashion. There are also interdisciplinary conferences, but we really, with the program, cater primarily for the uh, disciplinary uh, work. That's, mm -hmm. a, that's mm -hmm. the difference for me and I think one that there are drawbacks and advantages to both uh, so I think in choosing uh, it's a matter of thinking about what kind of context one would like to work with. Would one like to work with a traditional uh, disciplinary understanding uh, of knowledge and academia and do research within it and of course what that is moves itself uh, as you were talking about when you were talking about uh, the shifting mm -hmm. uh, role of um, questions of race, gender, uh, intersectional um, uh, issues uh, in academia so it's not a sort of fixed thing or would one rather work with in an interdisciplinary context than have a background say uh, in, in survey, we do a lot of environment. Like the themes we have here is not surveillance studies that came to my mind, but it's, uh, uh, of course, the, the interdisciplinary. So uh, gender, um, the environment, mm -hmm. etc. So, so those are the choices uh, one makes. I think. That's okay. Thank yeah. you. Um, again, I don't know if we have uh, students behind me in the audience from uh, this particular program, and we do. Thank you so much. Maybe our students can tell us a little bit about why uh, they chose this particular program and uh, any 
interactions with professional organizations and where you plan to perhaps uh, you know, develop your careers in the future. So both of those, of those topics. Uh, hi, my name hi. is Francia Capas. I did both my master here and I'm now in my second year as a PhD student at the Institute. Um, I can just echo many things Professor Leander just said. It is uh, both academically very rigorous, but also allows you to interact with international Geneva and apply much of the theoretical knowledge straight away. And um, it is an exceptionally active community. There is plenty of room for collaboration. Uh, there are uh, many events happening on a regular basis where also visiting scholars are being invited. Uh, which also reflect the diversity of the faculty uh, in many ways. So I would say while the institute, uh, the department provides you with uh, the disciplinary uh, knowledge uh, needed to, to kind of go your own way and develop your identity as, as, uh, as a future professional or scholar, should you choose that path. Um, yes, there is a lot of room for creativity as well. Thank you. Is there anybody else from the program? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Anna, about the, and to our students about that, uh, for introducing that, uh, the program in international relations and political science. So our last program to be presented today is the program in um, anthropology and sociology, and we have Pro Professor Aditya Bharadwaj with us to present it. Um, so, uh, Aditya, can you tell us in just a few words about the MA and PhD programs? Yes, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, MA and PhD programs at uh, Anthropology and Sociology, which we affectionately call ANZO, yes. we abbreviated <laughs> down to um, this very pithy little um, acronym, um, uh, are essentially covering a whole spectrum of um, uh, curriculum offering uh, across the two disciplines and what makes us really unique is that our program is bidisciplinary right. and rather than bridge the two uh, disciplines uh, our primary um, effort is to blend the learning experience between seemingly separate uh, but uh, quite um, um, uh, similar in some regards to as far as methodological orientation goes and as well as you know conceptual and theoretical embedding uh, goes. Uh, so there is a blended uh, approach to uh, curriculum and, and of course there's a range of uh, specialisms that uh, students pick. Uh, I could range from medical anthropology through to visual and art through to finance and, um, uh, and political anthropology and so on and so forth. So it's a very vibrant program, it's a two-year master's program and, um, and our student body comes from all over the world, our faculties indeed are very international as well. And I think one of the most striking things about our teaching and the curriculum is that a lot of what we teach our students is research-led. Mm. So a lot of the research that the um, faculty uh, bring uh, to the department and, and their research collaborations elsewhere eventually percolates and filters down uh, into our teaching. And that really does um, benefit students in, in very unique and interesting ways. Because they f A, have a ringside view to seeing how a research project emerges and evolves and grows, but also to uh, be able to engage with research as it's unfolding. And then to be able to um, look at the var larger uh, f uh, frameworks within which uh, this research is conducted. So in a sense, it's very good training mm -hmm. in real time. And of course, there is a dovetailing that uh, it's not all classroom learning because we have a very um, amplified focus on methodological training. And so rather than um, make it all about in-class learning, we do take our students out into the real world uh, to experience it firsthand what it is to actually conduct um, uh, a research project. So it, it's, I would say, it is a learning experience in the literal and metaphoric sense of the term, because you really do push your personal limits mm -hmm. uh, in ways that uh, passive learning in a classroom situation uh, very seldom uh, offers. So it's, it's a fantastic program in that respect, and, and I think the one other thing that we really much um, um, like to introduce our students to is um, bring in 
visiting faculty from around the world and to expose them to the up-to-date ideas. Uh, emerging in other parts of the world which you, they would not otherwise have access to. So I think that really enriches their learning experience as well. So I could Thank go you. on. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hear it from um, some of the students. I don't know if our student from anthropology and sociology are here. Yes. Um, so what are some of the exciting um, academic or research projects that you've been uh, engaging with recently? Um, well, I'm, uh, I'm from the first year M MA, so yes. I can't really talk about a research project right now. But um, I personally uh, was really attracted to the, the discipline because uh, offered here because of uh, the faculty and their research interests, which allied with mine, and also the range of subjects provided, as Professor Padwar spoke about. And I personally feel that the assignments we have are very, not only intensive, but also they get you thinking from very different creative angles. And um, the focus on research methodology, which I mm -hmm. think is very important and integral to the discipline of both anthropology and to some extent sociology too. Um, one of my favorite assignments right now is uh, conducting field work in the city of Geneva itself. And uh, it's surprising what you can find uh, through an anthropological lens when you look at the city that way. Um, it's also a pleasure listening to the impressive range of guest lecturers and visiting professors that you have. So we currently are having weekly uh, lectures on a variety of issues starting from economics, sociology to um, the so sociology of war, memory, violence. It's very unique and especially obviously the, the cohort. Uh, not only is it really small, uh, which makes you know interpersonal relations so much easier and um, but also it's very international and cosmopolitan. So we and my classmates, they are from countries like Ghana, Turkey, Morocco, India, and obviously Switzerland and France. So it's always a pleasure to interact with them and exchange ideas. So yeah, uh, yeah it's a great place to be in. Thank you. Um, Aditya, can you perhaps give us an idea of some of the career tracks that might be open to students in the program afterwards? Yes. Um, the career tracks, and, and one could, I mean, just going by my own experience, uh, start with some of my own PhD graduates who've gone on to work in the UN. Um, um, we've had students from our department graduate and uh, going to work with international think tanks. Um, and of course, a vast majority of our PhD graduates uh, go on to very successful academic careers. So, so that's um, uh, the, the PhD and research side of uh, uh, the exit velocity of an uh, average student coming out of a department. But in the master's um, program, again, we found that um, we're able to absorb a lot of our MA students into our PhD programs. And mm -hmm. that's, I think, is one of the very heartening aspects of uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, working with MA students. Uh, they, the conversation evolves over a two-year period, and then um, they grow um, uh, a research project very organically um, 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 based on their interaction with sort of various offerings within the curriculum. And then um, some get absorbed uh, within our own PhD programs. And some of our MA students have gone on to PhD positions in the US and, and beyond. So, so there's a very, very successful um, uh, trajectory there just uh, in the academic uh, uh, sector. But we've also had MA students go work for international organizations uh, once they graduated from here. And, and so there, there's, there's a very vast sort of tapestry of uh, experience when it comes to the kinds of employment opportunities a master's or a PhD mm -hmm. uh, from our department offers. Thank you. Um, a very specific question that we mm -hmm. received, but actually I think that opens up an interesting discussion that we'll um, pursue afterwards with all of our programs, um, is uh, about what kind of profile of students uh, will be successful in, in the program. And the specific question is um, about uh, a student applying for the PhD program, but with limited work experience, um, you know, what is the weighting that is given to students' professional experience and also to previous publications mm -hmm. when you are evaluating applications for the uh, doctoral program. So if we can hear it maybe from you, Aditya, first about your program, but I think afterwards this can open up a discussion uh, sure. in more general terms as well. So certainly I would say publications help, but it's not just the publication, it's the quality of the publication. 
So, um, and of course, if it's in a peer-reviewed journal article, what kind of a peer-reviewed journal article it is, yeah. and what's its sort of substantive value. But having said that, I think f uh, mostly what we gravitate towards is a very well worked out uh, research idea, and and how um, uh, well it's likely to fit into um, uh, the constellation of expertise within the department, and of course. Um, um, some background in sociology or anthropology certainly helps, but we have had students come from other very different backgrounds and have done very successfully and done really rather well um, uh, in the MA level and, and, and even indeed as a PhD um, uh, scholar. So um, I would say work experience is not absolutely required uh, uh, for a successful applicant, at least not at the master's level, and most certainly uh, even PhDs. Um, uh, we don't uh, take work experience as, as a defining criteria. However, um, a publication record uh, for a PhD um, is always appreciated and welcome, but it's not a necessity. The focus is invariably mm -hmm. on how worked up and uh, evolves the research uh, uh, proposal is. And, and, and one of the good things is that uh, potential applicants can reach out to us and discuss. Because with, in a PhD program, essentially, you're spending uh, quite a number of years with a supervisor. So it's always good practice to reach out and discuss your um, uh, ideas um, and before making a formal application. And we're always available to have those interactions with prospective students. Um, but as I said, um, no work experience as such right. is imp you know, required for a successful candidate to uh, uh, find a place in the program. Okay, thank you. That's good to know. And just as a reminder to our viewers that the contacts of the um, of, of all of our programs, the, the web pages will be posted in the comments right below the, the video, so you can, you can check that. Okay, um, thank you so much. Um, we do have another student from the uh, Department of Anthropology and Sociology who has joined us. Hi, Nina. I don't know if um, you, know, you have anything else that you would like to, to share about your experience also coming into the PhD program and... Uh, uh, yeah, sure. and yeah. Um, so my name is Nina. I um, also did my master's here and now I'm um, at the end of my PhD. And very much as Adi said, I think it's very good if you get in touch with a couple of faculty before that you think that might be interested in your proposal, that share maybe similar research interests to you, um, and just to get a better feeling also for what their other research is about. For most of them, you can look at their CV on the web page, for example, as well, to, to get a sense of that. Uh, you can also look at the different centers that faculty is, uh, is, aff is affiliated with. So, for example, if you have um, a particular interest that is covered by one of our centers, you might want to work with somebody who is also affiliated with that. So that would also be one of my um, pieces of advice to prospective PhD students to, on the one hand, check the website of the department and then also look through the different research centers that we have here. And in ANSO, I think uh, our faculty, we have faculty in almost all research centers, so it's, it covers quite broad ground. So to add to, to IDTS comments. Great, thank you so much. Um, I think we, we can uh, wrap up the um, presentation of our uh, specific disciplinary programs. Um, any, anything else to add, uh, maybe particularly about master's select, uh, student selection, and is it necessary to have a background in the same discipline when students come in? So we have economics and uh, international law, yes. So <coughs> I would say at the master level, uh, it definitely helps. Um, <coughs> someone would come in a master program with you know, no prior knowledge of economics and will have to pick up from scratch, we'll have a tough time. Uh, so, so you need to, uh, to have uh, already acquired uh, the basics of micro, macro, uh, the standard, and also uh, some technical aspects already. Uh, the reason is simply, uh, simply that without coming without this, uh, there would be a, a very struggling first year for the person. Um, many of the applicants will have a law degree. 
But what we will be looking for is how well they've performed in international law. So if you have a, I don't know, I'll pick on Italy, a law degree from Italy and you've done family law and constitutional law and criminal law, but you didn't really do very well in international law or you didn't take many classes, then you're not really ready for our master's programme. Having said that, there are also non-lawyers who apply. They might have done an international relations degree or political science degree, and we would like to poach them if they're very good <laughs> and they've already studied a bit of international law, and if they want to come to us, uh, they're very welcome. National law is not really a requirement because you could know a lot about divorce law in France, but it's not necessarily what you need to do to make a contribution to international law here at the Institute. Okay, thank you so much. Um, if we have time for a couple uh, general questions again, particularly for our um, students. So one thing that um, I think our uh, prospective students who haven't been here yet might be curious about is just to know, you know, what does a week look like for students studying here at the Graduate Institute? So how much time do you spend going to class, doing homework, engaging with a reading, um, teamwork, group work, and how much free time do you have? So, uh, really open question to anybody in the audience behind me. So, hi, my name is Amedem, master's student in history, second year, and uh, I would say on average we have five, two hours classes a week uh, in the history department. So that makes ten hours of class, but then next to that you have, uh, yeah, it depends on the class, but like four hours of readings, working, looking, researching of, on your paper proposals and then you have uh, like four hours for uh, each class and then you have also free time that allows you to enjoy the city of Geneva try to learn some French to enjoy the lake and Switzerland so you have uh, a lot of work let's be honest but then you also have time to enjoy what is available here and I have to say that the the facilities here are also welcoming to help you work. Uh, the library is very good and helps you in your research and also the other libraries in the city. So, yeah. I don't know if someone else wants to add something. Um, I would also add that um, the Institute has a bunch of very active student initiatives and they really have like fun programs going on almost every week. Um, uh, there is also, um, I think, a Center for Wellbeing Support, Student Wellbeing Support, and uh, th there's lots of events which can help you like cope with academic stress, or just if you want to like relax and have a movie night occasionally, or attend dance classes. And you'd be surprised to know how much, you know, how many ap aperos I've attended since <laughs> I've come here. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's like uh, a go-to word for us, like if you want to like just hang out by the lake or enjoy a sunny evening or even like skinny dipping in, in the lake. That's like new, but it's new to me because <laughs> I'm not used to the temperature. But yeah, it's, it's a wonderful place to relax and chill with your friends. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We may need to add a caption uh, underneath the video to explain to our international audience what the French apéro means. So uh, we, will, we will do that. Last question to our, uh, both our students and our professors. Um, we have a very international student body here and a very international um, faculty as well. And so I'm curious to know if your last school where you either taught or studied wasn't quite so international, how does this experience compare, particularly in the classroom? What does it mean to be studying, interacting, engaging, teaching an international student body um, by comparison to some other schools? Anyone? Sure. I'd be really, for me, it's quite recent because I actually arrived here only four years ago, um, unlike many people who've been here for very long. So as a professor, being here is fantastically interesting uh, because the student, you learn so much from the students and it's really uh, a privilege to uh, be in this environment uh, and to engage. And I, I would assume actually that the same holds true for the students. So I, I came fr here from Denmark to be very concrete in a school that prouded itself on being very international and uh, global uh, in reach. Uh, and it's been a world change for me uh, uh, in terms of how I see uh, the classroom. Uh, and enormously interesting because people come with their background and their um, different uh, educations and personal experiences and so on. So it's, uh, it's a very, very interesting place actually to teach. Thanks. 
Um, just to add to that, yeah. I mean, we indeed have a very vibrant student community across departments, but um, just falling back on my ANZO experience, um, there is always this um, out of classroom engagement that I think I find really quite mm -hmm. um, uplifting. And, and it almost has a sense of a conversation which is ongoing uh, over a period of time. Uh, which is very valuable and I, I hope and, and I, I do think in some cases I know for a fact that students find it uh, really very valuable. So that's one. And the other thing is that often students get very stressed and I see them coming from different parts of the world where they get evaluated very differently. Um, they invariably have questions about classroom participation, right? Mm -hmm. They get very anxious. Um, if I don't raise my hand every f 10 minutes, you know, do I kind of not get the grade, the 30% or 20% or whatever my overall grade at the end of the course uh, uh, would be. Um, and to them, I always say, so long you can hear my voice and that of the others, um, consider that as participation, mm. right? And uh, different students participate differently. You know, some are more expressed, some are very reserved, some listen quietly and then approach you after the class, and some just engage and, and debate. So. So one of the things that we do is, is, is there's no sense of one size fits all. You know, people are very free to express themselves the way they choose in, in the classroom setting. And, and that really does allow you know, personalities to come out in very interesting ways and, and that somehow gets sutured into the learning experience and, um, uh, and, and their overall um, experience of the program. So I think that's also very, very valuable. Mm -hmm. And as I said earlier, you know, for them to interact with the international faculty and indeed the very international background of our own faculty um, is, is really quite invaluable. Yeah. Um, it really does open up uh, the world, literally and metaphorically, in the classroom. Yeah, and thank you for reminding us that diversity has many different uh, expressions, right? Not only international, but also in terms of personalities and communication styles and many other things. I will leave the last word to our wonderful students. Any, any comment, any feedback on what is it like to uh, interact in, in these very diverse classrooms? I think, for one, it's very interesting to meet people from very different places and very different walks of life. It's particularly interesting to know that you meet someone from every continent, which I think is very mind-blowing, because every time you hang out, it looks like a diversity picture. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. You also try to learn about different cultures, what people eat, various holidays, and it actually broadens your appreciation for different experiences in life in general. And I think it's very invaluable to get to know people on that level and actually value what they bring to the table. And no amount of exposure prepared me for this, I would say, yeah. Okay. Any, anything else to add, yeah? If I may add, uh, as a student from Switzerland, I have to say it's very good to have this school here because we are in Switzerland, but it, it's another world, and mm. it's a discovery here uh, to have all this diversity, and it's very rich in classroom. We have some really interesting exchange with a lot of experiences, uh, personal experiences, personal backgrounds that really bring something to the discussion in every class. So I have to say it's a clear asset of the Institute. Thank you. And on those inspiring words, uh, I think we will end our open, uh, open house for the academic disciplinary programs. I would like to give my very, very warm thanks to all of our professors here today, to all of our students, to the technical team, to our colleagues who run this wonderful space uh, of the Fabrique de la Paix here at the Institute. And uh, I hope that uh, this has been useful to our new applicants, to our prospective students. Thank you very much.